Let's let people in then. Admit. Oh, here we go. <laughs> all right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome, welcome. Hello, everyone. How are you all? Uh, good to see you all. I see some familiar faces already, which is incredible. Uh, thanks for joining us again. Uh, and some new faces too, which is really, really cool. Um, so yeah, thanks everybody. Uh, this is uh, 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 our fourth um, uh, uh, virtual distillery tour. Uh, we are live uh, in the uh, Andes. Uh, you'll be able to see in a second the Andes uh, just behind us in Ecuador. Uh, and we're with uh, 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 Elliot uh, Logan Hines, who is the creator of uh, Chawa and the Agave. So uh, Elliot, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, we've got such an incredible tour today. Uh, this is going to be just absolutely amazing. Uh, well, not only are we live, which is one of my favorite kind of tours, we're also in the mountains. We're also in Ecuador. We're also talking about a distilled beverage that has a really fantastic, uh, wonderful history. Uh, Elliot is a large part of that history. I can't wait to dive into that in a second as well. Um, and uh, Ecuadorian uh, uh, distilled agave beverages is something that not a lot of us know anything about. Um, and uh, I, I, I can't wait to uh, dive into it. So, um, uh, Elliot, um, uh, why don't you introduce yourself uh, and, uh, and, and tell us all a little bit about you and then, uh, and then we'll get going. Cool. Well, uh, hello. Um, welcome, everybody. Welcome to our, our distillery here in, in, in Ecuador. I've lived here in Ecuador for about 10 years. Uh, and I, my background, I'm a, I'm a forester. Um, I, I'm a plant lover, uh, and that's sort of how I got down here to Ecuador. Ecuador um, is an amazing country when it comes to plants, when it comes to biodiversity. Uh, it's right on the equator, which is where the name Ecuador comes from. But it also has a huge difference of, of, of altitudes. You have the Andes Mountains right behind me. There's a 20,000-foot there's a volcano uh, over there in the clouds that you can't see with glaciers on it. And then behind me, if you were to go all the way down those mountains, uh, you end up in the Amazon rainforest. So we have tons of microclimates here. We have, uh, and here where we are right now is sort of in, in, on a, in the verge of a desert. If you go north of here, you turn way into a very dry desert. And then again, just on the other side of the mountains, you have this amazing rainforest. Um, and that's how I came down here. I'm, I'm a forester. I, I was working down in the Amazon uh, with another amazing plant called Wayusa, which is uh, in the family of yerba mate. It's a, a tea leaf. Uh, and I was working on, on with indigenous communities, learning about the plants they, they, they use down in the Amazon. And I realized, I stumbled upon agave. I realized that agave grows all over the mountains here in, in the arid regions. And about five years ago, I uh, started sort of poking my nose around and, and asking people what they do with this plant. And I found out that there's this really rich tradition that most people don't realize exists in Ecuador. Uh, most people think sort of agave is all from Mexico, uh, but actually it turns out for thousands of years, indigenous people have been harvesting the sap of agave. Uh, they call it chawar mishki in the Quechua language. Uh, chawar means raw and mishki means sweet. Um, and that's sort of how we uh, came, started just slowly working with people figuring out sort of what what this tradition was and then we uh we built this distillery today's actually our our second year anniversary of the distillery here um and in the back in a, in a little bit we'll go and meet, meet our team they're all celebrating uh and we're having a big feast right now that we just harvested from our farm in the back um and you'll get to meet them in a sec too that's right. So we had, uh, um, uh, and that's why I'm so kind of interested about, uh, about this. So um, uh, we do a little bit of, uh, actually we do quite a lot of back and forth before we get to this point. Uh, and we've had some fantastic conversations uh, kind of along the way. And uh, so, so Ellie and I uh, met last, uh, uh, when was it? January, I believe in, uh, in uh, San Antonio, the San Antonio cocktail conference. Um, and, uh, and, you know, one of the events was just come and try some Andy and agave spirit. And I thought my partner and I thought that sounds incredible. Let's give that a go. And then we were so uh, fortunate to meet you and, uh, and uh, 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 you would rent it a house. It was this beautiful house. Uh, and uh, there was uh, a bunch of chawa kind of all over and you had some wonderful um, Ecuadorian coffee uh, that was available as well. And it was just such a, a, a beautiful uh, humbling experience, which, uh, 
uh, we've got to look forward to as well uh, with this virtual tour. Um, but a lot of kind of what brings you there um, is uh, the kind of connection between um, the local uh, community and uh, the indigenous communities and the agave. Uh, and uh, it's, it's, it's so very different to what we're used to. We were talking about it uh, just yesterday. Um, in, in, in Mexico, a lot of my background, you can even see from behind me is uh, kind of tequila and mezcal, or I see every, uh, agave spirits that are, are very Mexican in focus. And obviously we've got a lot of those, uh, a lot of the Southern states, California, Texas, New Mexico, have a lot of agave spirits and, uh, and, and all through Latin America as well. Um, but you'll find that a lot of them uh, are very kind of, uh, uh, especially in Mexico, it's a man's world, agave spirits. It's, it's all, all the himidors are men. Most of the distillers are men. Uh, we were super fortunate to uh, do a virtual distillery tour last week uh, with Ocho Tequila. Uh, and we was talking to Fanny Camarena, uh, who uh, her and her sister are two of the most prominent people in tequila. Uh, but there really isn't a lot of them. Whereas it's, it's a very female-led uh, environment there, right? Yeah, totally. So... Um, what's really interesting is that the, the harvesting of agave is almost always the, the woman's job, but beyond thinking of it as a job, it's really about the, the sort of women's relationship with the plant. Um, and so when we first started sort of just asking questions and we got, we met this group of women, um, in the town of Kayambe, which is just about 30 minutes north of here. Um, and we we sort of started just asking questions and and i realized that there was a, a little bit of a i mean obviously i'm a man i don't know if that and i'm a foreigner um but i realized that there was a little bit they they weren't it, it took a while for them to warm up to me and to us sort of asking these questions and what i realized that was that they really had a very that part of the the the, the challenge in sort of reaching out to them was that their relationship to this plant was so special it was so like unique and it was so intimate that, that I think there was a, that, that it kind of took, it took us years really to sort of warm up to them. And, and I think that is, is, is really beautiful. There's a, there's a story about um, one of the women um, of the, we, we helped them to form the first cooperative of, of indigenous women, agave producers in the country. Um, and one of the, one of the women was, very very old and getting sick she was like in her 90s um but it was so important to her to harvest agave every single day that her kids went and pulled a whole plant out of the ground and brought it to the, her to the right next to her door and so the way that it works I, if you guys are familiar with pulque in mexico they make a hole inside the plant and and it starts to bleed out sugar water and they scoop it out you get about two liters a day for up to 200 days in a row. So really the women are going and they're harvesting the, the sap, but they're going back to the same plant every day for 200 days. And so for this woman, this old lady who could barely walk anymore, it was so important for her to maintain that tradition of, of harvesting from the plant that her kids brought the plant to her. And I just thought that was such a great, like an amazing story, but it also sort of just shows that the beautiful connection between these women and the plants. And in a little bit, you'll meet uh, Elizabeth, who's our, our still master here, um, she's been working with us for two years as we've created this uh, recipe for how we how we distill it. And, and so basically our whole product is, is made by indigenous women from harvesting all the way to the to the distilling. I just think that's incredible. And you find a lot of more, much more in, in, in the world of Mezcal and, and, and certainly Ricea as well, um, which is a, a two areas that I'm a little bit more familiar with uh, than, than, than Chawa. And you, you find that um, it brings the community together. It brings uh, 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 money into that community as well. Uh, and it really does, um, uh, the brand ends up uh, bringing together uh, that community in such an incredible and important way. And, uh, and it seems that you're, you're, you're kind of going down uh, that same path, which is super cool. Yes, so definitely. We had, um, so obviously um, um, we've, we've had a little bit of a discussion of your background before we go into uh, kind of anything on the production side, because we do have a lot to talk about, about the harvesting. Obviously this is uh, a little bit more, if anyone doesn't know what pulque is, let me just comment on that very quickly. Uh, pulque is uh, just the fermented, uh, sap from the agave. So uh, we've spoke about uh, when we've been in tequila distilleries, we've spoke about harvesting the agave where we would remove all of the leaves and then take the pina, which is the bulb of the plant. And then we cook that and there's a lot of romance around cooking it. And, uh, and then we press it and, and extract the juices. And then we ferment. 
but with polke, which is a, a, a fermented beverage as opposed to a distilled beverage, what would happen is you would take the, um, the, the juices from the plant uh, and, then, uh, and then they'll be fermented. And that fermentation as well is quite interesting in the, uh, and, and I'm not sure whether it's the case with you, but I know with a lot of uh, with polke, it's a bacterial fermentation as opposed to a yeast uh, driven fermentation. Uh, and, uh, uh, and, and it's not distilled in Mexico. Uh, but you are very much distilling it as well. But let's talk about your background just a touch before we get onto that point and start going into all of that. So uh, you're American, obviously. Um, and, and which state uh, do you uh, originate from? I'm from Texas. I'm a Texan. Okay. Uh, and then, um, so uh, born in Texas, uh, you went through, uh, 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 why don't you tell us, because it ended up, uh, you ended up in, in, in Yale uh, um, getting your master's in, environmental science if I'm correct yep mm -hmm. okay um so yeah quick background when I when I will when I graduated from college and I I don't know if it was I, I guess partially I was like scared to grow up I, I don't know but I <laughs> I decided with my friends we all went on a trip to Costa Rica and we ended up buying a coffee farm uh, it was incredibly cheap I was 21 years old I had no idea what I was doing I didn't speak Spanish uh, and me and my friends, we each spent the, the farm with the house, everything cost $5,000. We split it between four people. Uh, and I ended up living in Costa Rica for about four or five years. That's where I learned Spanish. I, I was on a coffee farm. I lived in a coffee growing community in a tiny town in the middle of nowhere in Costa Rica. Um, but I, I, that's when I really sort of became interested in plants. Um, I was really interested in trees and, and reforestation. Uh, and I started a, a small NGO in, in Costa Rica focused on supporting coffee farmers with uh, reforestation and, and trying to figure out how they could sustainably manage their, their land that was going through lots of problems with the changes of the coffee market and prices of different commodities, sort of making people didn't know what to do. And so we were really focused on, on supporting people with, with trees as an alternative. Um, and through that work, uh, I ended up going to, to Yale to the forestry school. I got a scholarship to, to study forestry. Um, and, you know, it's funny now when I, when I think about it, like sometimes it's like, oh, I make alcohol. What does that have to do with forestry? Well, really, it has a lot to do with forestry. Um, I mean, agave, if you think about it, is really much more, it, you could think of it much more as a tree or as a, as a plantation of trees rather than a normal crop because of the time horizon, how long it takes to grow. Um, and, and especially for farmers in Mexico or, or here in Ecuador, that's a long time investment, which is much more similar to a forest, forest plantation. Um, and so I'm, I'm surprised always about like how, much, how much really this is connected to forestry. Um, and so I came down here to Ecuador to start. I, there we, I was a co-founder of a brand called Runa. I'm not sure if you guys have ever heard of it. Um, it's kind of hard to find now, but it was fairly popular, especially in New York for a little while, of this uh, super leaf from the Amazon called Wayusa. Um, and it, very similar to Yerba Mate, a very caffeinated uh, leaf that comes from an ancestral tradition here in Ecuador as well. And I, we started a nonprofit. So we had this nonprofit, for-profit sort of hybrid organization. And I ran our nonprofit. And our nonprofit was really focused on how can we work with indigenous communities that have all of this knowledge of plants and how could we create markets for those plants how could we create sources of income and livelihoods for these people while also preserving their knowledge and using that as a tool for this the sustainable management at, at this i started off in the amazon looking at how could we save the rainforest um, and then through that nonprofit, as we grew i started looking at new plants and then i realized that there was agave growing everywhere. And so what's really crazy, I think, about this whole sort of story is that our distillery, everything started from grant money from a nonprofit. We had grant money from the MacArthur Foundation and from a local nonprofit here in Ecuador. And so we started a liquor company um, from a nonprofit. Uh, and now that nonprofit, I've stepped down from that nonprofit. That nonprofit is, is an owner of this, is, is a shareholder of this company. And part of our vision is that as this, as this grow, as we grow the brand, um, we really want to pump, we want to use this to be able to pump money back into these communities, support local communities, and also support them in the sustainable management of their landscape. Um, so, yeah, that's my 
What, a, what an amazing story. <laughs> Dude, I, I, just, I just love your story so much. I'm so excited that, to, to introduce you to all these people. I think you're such a fascinating guy. And, uh, and also, uh, Elliot has offered everybody here as well, and I'll send it out afterwards. Uh, um, what was the title of your PhD thesis? No, okay, so, sorry, I actually did not get a PhD. <laughs> Whatever it was. Uh, I read it yesterday. It's fascinating. Yeah, yeah. So it's a. Uh, we studied. So I, I, one of the very first thing, when I got some grant money, the very first, I got the first grant money that I got, I got $3,000 from a small foundation in the US to just research what do people in Ecuador do with agave. And so I teamed up with this really badass lady her name's Lucia I don't know if she's on here uh but she's a an ethnobotanist here in Ecuador and we went through the entire country documenting how do different indigenous communities use agave um and if you read yeah I can share you guys the paper we published it ironically in a Mexican uh scientific journal called botanical sciences uh but what's really interesting is that actually, in, if you were to just look at the number of uses of agave historically in Ecuador, it's more versatile than, and the uses are more varied than they are in Mexico. People use agave for fiber. They use it, I mean, very similar to Mexico, but they use it for fiber. They use it for medicine. They say that it, the, the, the juice is good for arthritis, which I actually think makes a lot of sense because there's lots of minerals from the volcanic soils here. Um, they use it as shampoo. They use, uh, there's a mil, there's, well, there's 121 di registered unique uses of agave of indigenous communities here in Ecuador. And so that was sort of our first little thing was to publish this paper. Um, and, and also it, it kind of gave us a sense of where in Ecuador does this culture exist? I think one, one thing that's very unusual is that most, even Ecuadorians don't know that this culture exists. It's very, it's a very sort of hidden thing that, that a lot of indigenous communities have where the mestizos or sort of the white people don't know that in their backyard, uh, indigenous people are harvesting agave. They have no idea that that's happening. Um, and I think that's part of why it's not very popular. The world doesn't know that either. Um, and, that, and that paper uh, you've made available to all of us uh, and you've given, given us permission, given myself permission to share that with everybody uh, who's registered for this talk as well. So I'll be sharing that out after the talk. And I, I, again, I read it. Yes, a fascinating read. It really is. A, it's, it's such an interesting read. And, and, and it speaks to very much kind of the connection between the plant and the culture. Um, can you just tell us a little bit about the culture there? Um, uh, is, uh, is, is Spanish the language? Uh, spoken in, in that culture is the um, a, a kind of microcultures within the area that you're in? Yeah, so Ecuador, um, similar to its cr amazing different microclimates, it also has very many different cultures. Um, the predominant language here is Spanish, uh, but there are over, I believe, 13 I think it's 13 indigenous languages that are recognized and maybe it's 17 different indigenous languages recognized here in Ecuador. Um, the, the cultures that, that harvest agave um, are typically uh, a Quechua. Quechua or Quechua, they say here in Ecuador, they say Quechua, um, which really is not so much of a reference to culture. It's actually a reference to the language system that they spoke which is the Incan language, Quechua. But the Ecuador has a, has a variation called Quechua, um, but it's basically a part of the Incan language, the Quechua language. Um, now, in different parts of the country, there's sort of different, um, there's different dialects, there's, and there's also different cultures within that sort of Quechua, sort of bigger culture. And so what's really interesting is here, so the, the women that we work with, um, they are Quechua, they identify as Quechua, um, but they actually, most of them don't speak Quechua. Um, they've sort of started to forget their language. That's in Kayambe, the, the, the one group. One of our goals as we grow and expand is we, we want to sort of create these micro distilleries throughout the country in all the different cultures and different places where they have an agave culture. Another part down south, there's a town called Salasaca, which is probably the epicenter of agave culture in Ecuador. Actually, on, in, the, in the plaza of the church, uh, or the church that's in the plaza, they have a stained glass window, and Jesus is rising out of an agave plant, um, just to show wow. how important agave is in, in that wow. place. 
Uh, and they are a really interesting separate culture. They also speak Quechua, but their and their ancestors they were they were uh, indigenous people from Bolivia who were really kind of out of control. And the the Incans the Incans when they were building their empire they didn't know what to do with these people, so they sent them to Ecuador, <laughs> and so like thousands of miles north, and they relocated and dropped these people in this valley, um, and to basically just keep them away from everybody else and they have created their amazing agave culture and they also have their own distilleries and they're still a pretty wild group of of people <laughs> we've had some interesting uh confrontations with them uh but all in, in good spirit um so there's uh there's a lot of different ones but the the women that we work with are quichua but they are losing their language they're sort of they're a little bit urban we're, we're very close to the city so even though they live up in the mountains and they're um, they maintain a lot of their traditional ways of agriculture. They're very close to the city. And so I think that kind of makes them lose a little bit their, their language. But Chawar Mishki, just to, to say this again, right. Chawar in the Quechua language means raw. Um, it's also sometimes used to refer to the agave plant, um, Chawar. And then Mishki is sweet. So Chawar Mishki is the agua miel, that's what they call it in, in, in Mexico, but it's the sap of the agave plant which is incredibly sweet. So it's sweet, raw. And I think that sort of as you were saying earlier about, about pulque, what really differentiates is, and why we chose the word chawar for our brand name is that it's a raw agave spirit. It's not cooked like tequila or mezcal. It's, it's the raw sap. Um, and so it has a very, very different um, profile, but that's sort of the, the culture behind it and where the words came from. It's so fascinating. And you have some bottles uh, just to your left. Yes. Let's, let's yeah. take a look. Here we are. So can you talk us through kind of what you have here? You've got a, such a great range already. Sure. So um, so this is our Blanco, uh, which is, we, we, we sell them in little bottles, little minis, and then our big one. I mean, this is my favorite. This is what we continue to, to, to improve this flavor. As, as, but this is our, our Blanco. Um, and then this is our reposado, which is uh, actually right now, this we use, we're using wood chips. So it's not actually in a barrel. Um, just to sort of see what, you know, what it would taste like once we do get barrels. I, this is sort of, you know, obviously the wood chips give it sort of uh, that flavor a little bit more familiar, I think, to people. I, I know a lot of people, when I, when I talk to tequila makers in, in Mexico, they say, oh, yeah, we made Reposado just for the gringos to make them feel better about <laughs> drinking it, right? Because it's like, oh, it tastes, it, like, tastes more like whiskey. And, and what's funny here, what I've noticed is in Ecuador, like, older men love this. Like, if, if, you're, if they're like a whiskey drinker, it's like, okay, they go with this. Because, to be honest, like, I mean, I love our Blanco, but it's, it's, a, it's, an, un, it's an unusual flavor. You, you've never really tasted anything like that. It's hard to sort of place it in your mind what it is. Um, so this is a little say, bit more familiar. And what would you say? I mean, because obviously we have uh, um, there isn't much of a history where you are of of distilling, right? Like like you have the the step which would often be fermented, but that extra step uh, for distillation doesn't often happen. Is that right? That's that's totally correct. I mean, there, right now there's about ten other small distillers in the country that are experimenting with this. Um, but generally, no. Historically, it was drinking as a fermented beverage or just as a sweet. Uh, fresh beverage. So how would you describe uh, the taste of the Blanco? Let's give everyone, because a lot of people won't know, uh, obviously, uh, ab about uh, and, uh, Andy and Agave, um, but also you have the, uh, you're not coming from the, the cooked Agave, you're coming from the sap itself. So how would you describe the, the flavor of this, just to give everyone an idea? So I think, like, a, a really good analogy, I think, is to think about um, sort of like an, like a, like an agricole rum, or, uh, you know, cachaca, or here in Ecuador, they call it caña, um, but a, a distilled sugarcane alcohol that's made out of the fresh juice, right? I think that, that there's, a, there's a similarity to that. I, I would sort of, if, if you guys are familiar with agricultural rums, I would say it's sort of in between, it's sort of a mix of a tequila and a agricultural rum. It's somewhere like in between those. That's so you definitely it well. It's beautiful. I remember the flavor so well. You can definitely taste the agave um but it, it it it's it's a little bit smoother subtle it's a, i'd say it's a little bit sweeter um it's not caramelized i think the big difference is when 
when with, with both mezcal and and well mo almost all agave spirits really you there the the cooking process whether it's roasting it or whether it's in the ovens like they do with tequila it's it's caramelizing the sugars right and so the and this is not this does not have that that process so the sugars are are staying sort of intact um in their sort of original sapped form which is why it's a little bit more similar to an agricole rum um another difference too is that here in ecuador i mean if you were just to sort of taste the difference between a pulque here oh by the way in in quechua the word for pulque is warango so um that's the local word what they call the fermented juice which is the pulque in mexico um it, it also has a different taste than mexico and i think part of that is because of one the altitude so we're this is harvested at about 10,000 feet. It's very, very high altitude, and we're right on the equator. So if you think about sort of the, the – as the agave goes through its um, life of, of, of photosynthesizing and, and, and storing sugars, uh, it's – because of the altitude, we have really huge changes in, in temperature between night and day. And so that basically concentrates the sugars more. So there's, I think the sugar content is higher. But also with the, the fermentation, when we go inside and check out our fer fermentation tanks, uh, we use all wild uh, yeast or bacteria uh, that are also bringing in with them the floral, the, the different pollens and, and floral notes that are, exist in the air here. And so there's a tropical sort of flavor that comes out, a very floral and tropical flavor that I don't think you quite get with uh, Mexican agave spirits. Um, anyways, just running through these other ones here. This one is, we'll probably never sell outside of our distillery. Uh, cause I don't think this one's super legal. Uh, but this <laughs> one, we, uh, we put, uh, we, it, it's chawar. So it's, it's agave, but we also have macerated the San Pedro cactus, which is a, is a hallucinogenic cactus here. It's, it's, it's similar to peyote. Um, it's used by shamans here in the, in the Andes. Um, this is a high proof. It's 55% alcohol. Uh, it's freaking amazing. So it, one thing is that uh, uh, San Pedro here is considered the grandfather medicine and uh, agave is like the grandmother medicine. And so this is sort of the combo of, of grandma and grandpa. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's really amazing. And this one, the uh, hallucinogenic properties uh, translate into the distilled form. I, I don't, I don't, think so um <laughs> but i mean it's also 55 percent alcohol so you can't drink too much of it without getting really drunk um but it does i it does kind of give you a little bit i mean i've had people i don't know if it's psychosomatic or what but people have told me that they do think that it it does something um anyways this one's a very we don't have very many bottles of this we do this every once in a while uh this is our new one we don't have a label for this yet um we're, we're calling this rosado, like, which is Spanish for pink, although I don't know how pink it actually looks anymore. Uh, but this has been uh, aged in a, in a French oak barrel that had red wine in it before. So it's, a, it's like a rosé. You know, there's a couple of tequilas that do that too. Um, and what's interesting is it was actually, uh, the barrel was used for a, an Ecuadorian wine, um, a red wine. And so it, this is actually my mom's favorite. I can see my mom up there. Uh, <laughs> uh, it has, uh, yeah, it kind of, the, the, the texture of the wine comes out that you, you get, it has a very unique, very different flavor than the rest of them. And then this one is our new, we just kind of came up with this label last week, actually. Uh, we call it Directo de la Lambique, which we kind of stole from Mexico, that idea. Um, but basically, this is a, this is agave and butter. This is a, a clay still. So we built, and we'll go visit in a second, but back here we have our palenque. We kind of copied some uh, mezcaleros. We built a clay still. And so this is uh, distilled in clay. It's also fermented in clay. Um, and, and it's called Directo de la Lambique because what we do is we do a third distillation and we take everything out and we don't dilute it with water. So it's just what comes out of the still. So right. it, this is about 48, 49% alcohol when it comes out at the end. I love um, the experimentation. I love that you're, that you're, you just seem so, you seem like you're having such a great time with this. <laughs> it's <laughs> really, <laughs> it, it's really fun. We also have some other crazy ones. We've, we've done some with coca leaves and other amazing, the Andes, 
South America has some of the coolest uh, plants, and we have a lot of uh, fun. I love it. Um, should we uh, should we check out the, the the distillery? Yes. Let me get um, Pamela. Pame. Hey. How you got it? Okay, we're gonna. Okay, hopefully this is a smooth transition. We're gonna switch to the different... <laughs> Let's figure it out. Uh, yeah. Eddie, what's happening back there? Do you want to just uh, let everyone know oh, what's happening? Yeah, on... so, this is Pamela. Hello. Um, she's, our, she's our brand ambassador uh, extraordinaire. And then in the back here, just really cool. maybe we'll go. Should we? Let's just go meet everybody. Let's go. We'll go meet everybody with, with this. <laughs> what is the about that? The telephone is just like Um. Okay, hopefully the internet. So again, we're having a, a birthday party because our distillery turned two years old today or yesterday. Um, and we're having a big lunch with uh, everybody. Um, but I'll, yeah, I'll have everybody introduce themselves. Robin Grefa, me llamo. ¿Y qué haces? Bueno, yo soy, yo estoy aquí, yo soy el encargado en reconstrucción y diseño de la planta de Chagua acá. So that's Robin. Um, he's my boyfriend. Also. But he is uh, our partner here and he built everything. He built our palenque here and he also built our greenhouse and everything back there. Robin, great to see you again. Hello. Elizabeth, soy la maestra destiladora de Chaguar, responsable de un excelente producto. So that's Elizabeth. She's our um, still master. Um, and she is the responsible party for our amazing liquor. <laughs> so that's Rosa. She's actually Elizabeth's mom. And she's an amazing farmer. And she is our agave farmer in the back. She's... So I work with her coming up with crazy ideas of how we're, we can grow agave sustainably here. And she is amazing. Everything that we're eating right now just came out of our farm. And she is a badass farmer. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Hello, everyone. How are you? I'm Rafael. Um, yo distribuyo chagua, la materia prima, aquí de, de la fábrica. Pues estamos trabajando en conjunto. So that, that's Rafael. He's our uh, he's one of our distributors, and he sells chawar throughout um, Quito. Yes. Sir. Okay, we're gonna switch now. Then come here. What what is in the cellar? Yeah. All right, we're gonna switch to my phone, and we're gonna go into the distillery. Give us one second. Okay. Okay. Did we switch? Yeah. Okay, you guys can hear me? It's all good. Your, 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 your sound quality is pretty good. Okay, cool. Okay, so this is our distillery. Um, so, these are our Elliot, we've lost your sound. Can you hear me? Oh, perfect. Hello. You're back. Where can you hear? Yeah, Hello. you sound great. Okay. Are we good? Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so thank you. So this is the pulque fermenting. Um we get about two, we get 250 liters of raw juice every day. So the women's cooperative in Kayambe comes, they bring the juice down. So we have a tank, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. And we, we take the juice, take it out of the truck and start fermenting. Um, like I said, this is all uh, spontaneous fermentation. It's all natural yeast and bacteria. We still need to do a little bit of analysis to sort of try to learn exactly how that fermentation process is working, but we're happy with our results so far. So um, 
but basically what we do is we kind of think about it as, as sort of a, like, like a sourdough, right? Where, where we take a little bit of the mother uh, yeast from, from one. So we take about two, two gallons or so, and we take it from one tank and put it to the next tank when we get our next shipment. So every day throughout the week, it comes in, and then we go fermenting, 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 and it takes about four to five days to, to get to the alcohol level that we want to go to our first fermentation. So this is just uh, a stainless steel, a limited steel. Uh, this is where we do our first, first run. Uh, if you look right here, it's coming out. We catch it in this guy. There it is. This, uh, it doesn't, I don't love the way that the first, <laughs> first stuff tastes. And how does it um, taste? Is it kind of uh, uh, very kind of raw and grassy? Yeah, it has sort of, I mean, it depends on what part of it. This is getting down towards the, 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 the tails of it. Um, it comes out, yeah, like our ordinario, um, you get through all the different flavors. It comes out a little bit like, like a, what I don't like is like a little bit of a broccoli smell, like a broccoli water. Um, we, it gets to about 18% alcohol once it's all mixed together, or, or we call it ordinario in Mexico. And this is our tank where we keep our ordinario. And you can see, if you look at it, it's not, you know, it's cloudy, right? Like it's not, we're basically just stripping out all the alcohol that we possibly can um, and we put it in here. And it takes about, so our, the capacity of these stills is 250 liters. And we have to do about three runs of the first distillation to get enough to throw into the second distillation. And what, and a, what ABV is the uh, Ordinario coming out at? Wait, say that again. The Ordinario, what ABV does that come out at? About 18%. 18, okay. Yeah. Um, and then this is our, our rectifying still, um, we call it La Dragona because she's fairly temperamental. Uh, <laughs> she can like spit out fire, actually. Yeah. The other day I got really scared because uh, we, yeah, it was getting a little crazy. It's fairly, she's fairly calm today. Uh, but it has four copper plates. So, I mean, I assume a bunch of you guys know, but for those of you that, that don't know, basically what the copper plates are doing is they're, they're making it recondense. You can see the drops coming back down. It's recondensing and, and then it, so what it does is it makes it harder for the vapor to go up the column. And so what that does is it basically stretches out the sort of band of alcohols that you're getting. And we can sort of pick the ones that we really want um, that, that smell, that tastes the best. So here it comes out um, right now. This is at, let's see, let me see, about 92% alcohol. So we're probably in the, yeah, we're in the hearts. We're in the hearts. We're in the, like, the pure hearts of it. Um, this, when we, when we kind of, Normally, when we're done with this, uh, it comes out on average about 89, 89% alcohol. Um, and then we come over here. So, again, so this must have been, uh, if we can go back to the stills for a second, there's, there's yeah. not a lot of, uh, of, of uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, background or, or, or expectations in, in distilled um, Andean agave spirits uh, or, or, or beverages. So, um, you kind of must have made the decision yourself to go with a pot still and then with a very short kind of column still as well. What was the thinking behind that? If there's no precedent, um, that was the word I was looking for. <laughs> no, no precedent. What was the thinking behind these stills? Yeah. Where did you come from and why did you decide on, on these two? Why did we decide that? Well, I, I can't say that it was necessarily like the most clear decision making process. Um, one was because we first started experimenting before we built this distillery we started experimenting with a, a vodka maker who is this crazy Polish guy that lived outside of Quito. And we would take the juice and just use his, his stills. And he had, and he was making vodka, right? So he had very similar stills to these. I think that was one reason. 
the other reason was that we we found this still was used. It was made by this crazy German guy who turns out was not, like kind of a, a Nazi to be totally honest. I mean, he said some really crazy things to me. <laughs> but anyway, but whatever. He's a nice guy. Just don't get drunk and go into politics with him. Uh, he lives out on the coast and he's like, an, you know, typical German, like he makes crazy machines. He had these two that he had already built. They were used and I was just like, okay, we'll buy them. So it was not super thought out really, um, but I'm really happy with what we've gotten. At the same time, one of the issues that we've had, when we kind of go back to like two years ago, was that because of this home still, because of the way that it's set up, we were, some of our first batches, I would say were sort of over distilled or kind of, they were a little bit too much of the hearts. They were, they felt, they kind of had a vodka flavor that I did not like. And so what we've been doing now is we've been really experimenting going deeper into the tails and incorporating more heads. And our newest batch, so come over here, what we do is, this is our Blanco, right? And so basically what we do is a, like a Solera system where we fill it up, because you know, we're, we're a really small distillery, we're super tiny, right? So we fill it up and then as we start bottling, we just take it out and keep filling it back up. And you can see, this is what our Blanco is. Um, but what we've started doing is that I really like to do, although this really freaks out Elizabeth, who, you know, really like has so much love and, and pride and ownership of everything. I'll come in and we'll do a crazy thing where I'll just grab a bunch of extra heads and just dump them in here. And she's like, oh my God, don't do that. Um, <laughs> and we wait a couple of days and the flavor is like amazing. We, we, uh, Really insane. We did this uh, last two weeks ago. We did we went through and we just added about half a liter. I mean, right now we have about 400 liters of alcohol in here. We added like half a liter or maybe a liter max of, of, of some pretty potent heads that, that tasted that smelled like you know, nail polish when we did. Um, but what it did was it just opened up the flavor. It, it created, we suddenly started realizing all these other notes some sort of cacao chocolate notes that we had never noticed before. It just really opened up the, the flavor of our Blanco. Um, and yeah, like right now, our Blanco right now, as of today, is probably the best we've ever had. And I think we continue to improve it. Um, and one of the issues that we'll have to deal with in the future is that the flavor is gonna not always be 100% consist consistent. Um, there's gonna be changes, especially in our Blanco. Um, but I think that's okay. Yeah, I think and more and more consumers are open to the fact that there will be some um, flavor changes in small batch products. I mean, we're, people yeah. are used to it in mezcals now, used to it in small batch tequilas, uh, and, and, and I think it should be expected of, uh, of, to be honest with you. And I think it's a great thing as well. I mean, I mean, I like a little bit of variance in it. It shows that it's real and it's made by hand. And we're really cool. speaking to that. Well, it's uh, like everybody expects it with wine, right? Like with wine, you expect that every year you have a different wine. Right, so exactly. And I think as people learn more about, about small batch and about agave, I think that's new. So here's our, our oak barrels. These are our, our wine barrels. As I said, we have, this is where we make our rosado. Um, and we're also doing a Solera system um, where we took out our first batch after three months. And then we just bottled our second batch after seven months. Um, this stuff we still have not exported to the U.S., but we're in the process of getting our label, everything ready to, to go to the U.S. In the U.S. right now, we've only exported our Blanco, and then this is where we keep our our reposado that we use oak chips with. Um, right. Eventually, we'll get real oak barrels. Um, oh. By the way, this little barrel here, this is interesting. <laughs> most people don't know But this barrel is, is Colombian oak. Most people don't realize that oak grows in Colombia. We went to Colombia and, uh, and found some barrel manufacturers. We're considering still buying from them. Um, and yeah, this has actually been in here for over a year. So 
we're, these are your second, one of our first set of experiments. Um, and then, well, basically, that's our distillery. I mean, this is where we bottle it. We do all hand bottles. Um, Elizabeth and Frank, her assistant, uh, do the, all the bottles by hand and put the labels on by hand. We see there's a bunch of bottles that we just do with the bottle. And then we put them in our boxes and then we ship them out. Um, palletize them and we're selling here in Ecuador a lot. And then we're also, uh, we just had our third export to the US. Um, it's currently in route. If you guys follow us on Instagram, I'm publishing every day. I found a, a, an app that tracks our cargo ship and you can see where it goes every day. Right now it's in Santa Marta, Colombia, and it's soon to be in Miami. Um, and then these are where we keep all of our samples. We also have our, we have our tequila ocho. We have all of our, all of our favorite tequilas that we always, uh, Taste against to try to compare where we are. You've got some, um, you've got some great brands up there that uh, that are setting your benchmarks. That's awesome. Yes, exactly, exactly. And we was actually um, and we also, uh, say that again. Uh, we was actually at Ocho's Distillery last week, and I see some Altos up there, which we're at next week. So what <laughs> what a what a crazy coincidence! You put your bookmark in our <laughs> virtual tours on your back bar there. Totally, totally, yeah. So I have, uh -huh. uh, I have a couple of questions just while we're at this point uh, that, that yeah. we should address. Uh, first of all, um, let's just get uh, one on your steels. Um, we have, uh, uh, why don't you use uh, copper steels instead of stainless steels? Uh, and what about the level of uh, compounds in the final spirit? Um, so why not copper? Like, I... I think in our next still, we're gonna build a new distillery and I would love to have a copper still. Um, but like I said, it really was just sort of coincidence that these are the stills we, we got. So it was the ones and that's sort of what we, inside them? we went with it. We, I'm a very, we're sort of a very go with the flow type of uh, organization. <laughs> we just kind of go with what we have. I um, love it. Also things, you know, you can imagine that in Ecuador, it's not as easy to get things like it is in other countries, right? So. Getting a copper still would be a little bit harder, um, but I, I do, we, I've made friends with one of the biggest uh, still makers in the country, and, and I, we're considering that for our next one. Mm -hmm. um, and then in terms of the, the sort of the compounds and the results of our, of our lab test, I mean, what was really crazy is our, when we first sent our stuff to the lab to get tested, um, the, the laboratory was shocked at how pure our alcohol was it was had very very little uh methanol or, or higher alcohols um, it was almost 100 percent ethanol which honestly freaked me out i was like i think we need to make our stuff a little bit dirtier uh <laughs> i want you know i mean that's sort of what i've been to oaxaca a bunch of times uh learning from them and i think the biggest takeaway that i have from from mexico is is make things Dirty, <laughs> make, it, make it throw more heads in there. Get, you know, experiment, be a little crazy. Um, yeah. So I think that's what that's what we're doing. Now. Have you looked at? Do you have on the back there? Uh, we've got a question with uh, Cometeco, which is a uh, fermented uh, uh, agave beverage from the sap, which is uh, from uh, I believe Chiapas. Um, have you done any comparisons with uh, any Cometeco as well, or is? Uh, you focus no, on I would love to. I would, I would absolutely love to. I think um, I've, I've still never been to Chiapas. I would like to go there. Um, one, one thing I would say, though, is that in Mexico, there are a few distilleries that make distilled pulque. Um, there's one in Puebla that's called Pulpata. Um, and I think there's a couple more. I think it's mostly in the Puebla area, which also has a really strong pulque tradition. Um, so they're sort of there. Um, but yeah, in terms of sort of comparing it to all the different types of pulque, I, I would love to do that. You know, I, one thing that I would say is when we were in Mexico uh, a couple years ago, uh, and I brought Chawar to everyone, and I went around to a bunch of distilleries and shared with them. Before they tasted it, when I first told them what it was, and they were like, oh, it distilled pulque. They were like, yeah, but that's not going to taste like anything. That's, sort of, that's boring. And I was like, wow, well, okay. And then they tasted our stuff, and they're like, wow, that's not what I thought it would taste like. Um, so, you know, I don't know. I'm, it, it's interesting because I think that I would imagine in the future there might be more. I mean, 
in, even in Mexico, to still do kids. And, you know, I think that at the same time, you know, there comes to a production issue because making pulque is hard. It's, it's not, for us, sort of to start off, it's easier because that's how all the women make, that's, they, they harvest this juice every day. That's what they've been doing for thousands of years. So we buy it from them. Um, but uh, I think at some point in the future, we'll probably experiment with doing other forms of agave, but um, like making a, a roasted or a, a cooked one, like similar to tequila or, or, mm -hmm. or mezcal. But for now, I think we're super, we, we really love char. I'm, a, and I'm probably our biggest fan. I probably drink the most out of that. <laughs> and you've had, um, um, obviously, we, we met in San Antonio at the cocktail conference. You're from Texas. That's going to be a big market for you. I know that you've got uh, uh, your pretty good distribution in Florida. Uh, wh what is your availability like uh, kind of in the States, in Ecuador, and, 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 and beyond that? Like in terms of production amounts? Or what uh, distribution. Or distribution. Um, so, yeah, right now we are... Um, we're mostly, we're, we're entirely focused on Ecuador and the U.S. Our main focus is really on the U.S. Um, as of right now, we are selling online um, and we can ship through our website. So you go to our website, we can ship online to most states in the U.S., um, like about 38 of the states. Uh, the U.S. has such draconian liquor laws, it's insane. But uh, those are changing every day with the coronavirus. Right. Uh, and we we are right now um, we're rolling out sort of so uh, in California, uh, New York, and Florida, we can actually sell direct to retail uh, through our brokers. And so as of right now, we're, we really we, our first shipping got to the U.S. in like the end of February, like right before coronavirus you know, made everything sort of fall apart. Uh, and so we are. We've been selling entirely online, um, and but next week we're actually activating Florida. Uh, I don't know if Evan's on there, but he's our Evan and Adam are going to be our two Florida sales reps, and maybe Rain. I don't know if she's on. Uh, <laughs> I'm trying to convince Rain to do it. Uh, so we're going to activate Florida next, uh, and California. Uh, we got Art. I don't know if Art's on, but uh, he's going to be our Bay Area guy. Uh, and then we're going to sort of start in, in New York. I think we're really, we're, we're going slow. We're a small distillery. We, we still don't have a huge capacity. Um, but we really want to create a strong brand and, and build it organically and, and sort of adapt to, to the world as we, as we enter into the, into the market. And, and if anyone wants to look at that, they can go to uh, drinkchawa.com. Uh, yep. and, uh, and have a look at the website and they can, they can order a bottle or so. Um, Elliot, should we, go, uh, should we go to the field? Should we have a look at some agave? Yeah. Now, is it, um, is it agave still referred to as, uh, uh, in, as agave there? Is it muge? It's the Americana specifically that, we're, that you're working with, right? Yes. So, well, let's, let's come on here. Okay. Um, okay, there might be a little bit of a technical... Whoa, whoa, whoa. You have my dogs very interested in what's going on right now. What is coming out of the internet? Yeah. Right, we're going to have a little bit of a technical issue. We're going to have to switch no, to our doctors. Salí, salí de la llamada. No, no creo que está saliendo. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Are you guys still there? Yeah, we can still hear you great as well. Okay, cool. Um, we just had to switch to the the cell phone back. Um. So yeah. So it's an Americana. Um. And maybe just to show really quickly. Uh. In in Ecuador, first of all, there's very little research on the taxonomy of the guy. There needs to be a lot more. There's two main species throughout Ecuador. Um, one is agave americana, and that's what, similarly in, in Mexico, what you can make pulque from. You can't take out, you can't make pulque from every agave. Um, but within americana, we call it the Andean sub-variety 
But even within that sub variety, there's lots of different varieties that are still not, we don't know taxonomically how to talk about them. But if you just look quickly, we planted these guys here. Um, just even between, I think, like this guy, uh, if you look at like this leaf, this is sort of a wide, a wide leaf right here, it kind of widens out. Um, that's unusual compared to most of them. Most of them have a much straighter edge. Uh, this is sort of the, the more typical looking uh, agave americana here. Um, it doesn't sort of widen out there. So I think both of these we could harvest, but I think that there's still a lot that we have to do, a lot of research that we have to do about the different varieties and sub-varieties that exist. And then this is our little cactus garden. Back there, that's the San Pedro cactus that I was talking about earlier that we used. Um, but anyways, this is our little garden, but back here is our farm. I love this. Okay. Well, okay. So, this is our coffee farm. Elliot, and, uh, Elliot yeah. sorry to interrupt. Um, do you mind just while we're here, just to build, uh, set the context, can we just have a little look around and kind of see what we're, like the landscape here? Just to kind of see where we are. Yeah. Look at this. So that right there, that's the church. I don't know if you can see that. It's in the sunlight. Uh, that's Yaruki is the town we're in. Um, and those are the mountains. Like I said, we're facing, we're facing east right now. So over those mountains, once you get to the top of those mountains, it actually, if you can look up there, there's a, there's a little, there's a couple of little peaks. They're kind of hard to see. That's a volcano called El Puntas. Um, that's the continental divide up there. So once you get on the other side of those mountains, you drop down into the Amazon rainforest. And all of the agave that we harvest right now comes from the women's cooperative. And all of those women live, if you can see that sort of, that, that hill that kind of slants up like that. They live right on the other side of that hill um, at the base of Cayambe, which is a huge uh, strato volcano. It's about 19,000 feet tall uh, and has an amazing glacier at the top. They live right at the bottom. It's a beautiful, beautiful place. Um, yeah, so this is, yeah, this is Yaruki. Yaruki, our area where we, this is one of the, a very, very major agricultural area. If you look at all the neighboring farms, um, that farm right there is a strawberry farm. Uh, this is a major strawberry growing area. This was a major potato growing area about 10 years ago. But the light killed off all the potatoes, but it's going to transition to uh, strawberries. And there's also a bunch of cabbage there, um, beans, um, different things. This is a, it's an amazing agricultural area. And so what we've done here, this is our little plot of land, is, you know, we're, we work with indigenous women who are have small holder farms. They're, they don't have huge amounts of land, right? So what we're trying to do is figure out how can, you know, how can someone who has a small farm like this, this is about, this is less than an acre, right? Um, you know, how could someone be incentivized to grow a plant that could take 10 to 13 years before you can harvest it? Um, and so what we're doing here is we're, we're using sort of a lot of the, the skills that I've learned throughout my, my education through my time in Costa Rica, but we're basically thinking of this as an agroforestry system. So what we're doing is we're, we're it's a polyculture. We're using, we're planting different crops. Um, and so right here, if you look at the, at the top here, this plant here in, in Ecuador is really common. They're called palas. It's like a palas. Oh, that guy right there. And the next group, those are beans. Um, and then below that, we have green beans. And then at the bottom, we have uh, lettuces, uh, bell peppers, and zucchini. Um, and so the idea of what we're doing here, is we're keeping track of everything that we grow, is we're saying, okay, if we were to take like this, it's maybe like three quarters of an acre. If we were to quantify how much agave we think that in 10 years you could harvest, we, we would, we've estimated that based on the price that we pay the women's cooperatives, that you would make $35,000 from the harvest of agave in 10 years, right? Which is a lot of money for a, like less than an acre. Um, and it's a lot of money for here in Ecuador.
but that's in 10 years. So the idea is what could you grow in between the agave um, and, what, and how much could you make from that or how much could you eat from that? And so what we're doing is we're, we're quantifying for every harvest, we're quantifying how much would that be the equivalent of if we sold all of our vegetables or how, how much would be the equivalent in money and how much would be the equivalent in calories. Because a lot of the, the, the farmers that we work with are also you know, semi-subsistence. They, they live off their land. Um, and it was kind of crazy, like coronavirus kind of shifted our whole perspective of everything because we were going to just grow corn and then beans and then squash, kind of the typical sort of Mayan uh, uh, trifecta of plants. But what we realized was, oh my God, now we're in a situation where we need food. And, and um, so we, we made it more diverse. We added lettuces, we added all these other things that we weren't really thinking about doing. Um, because we want to produce food for ourselves. This is a, so our, our, the party that we're having right now. This is all from our farm. Uh, so for our whole team, everybody can take you know vegetables home. And then with the excess that we have, we're going to donate it to, to people who, who don't have to drink. Um, and so we kind of realized, I think that's sort of the beauty. I, a lot of people in agriculture talk about resilience. And I think that the core aspect of a resilient agricultural system is that you say, oh my God, Wow, the world is going to be crazy. We have a pandemic. Let's, this isn't just a climate storm. This is a global struggle. Uh, let's, let's change the production so we can adapt to the needs that, that we all have as society. Has. And I love it. It's, it's so awesome. Uh, that's such a great, that's such a great uh, setup you've got there. It's, it's so incredibly well thought out. There's so many different moving pieces that I think all interlock with each other in such a fantastic way. Um, can I ask you a question, Ali, about, about the agave specifically? So you yeah. said that the uh, um, agave uh, Americana, now, is it referred to as agave in the, in, in the area? Wait, say that again, is it what? Uh, agave or muge, how, how is it referred to in the area? Oh, oh, oh. so the, the, the local word for it is panko. They call them pankos or agaves. Um, some people call them chava. That's very, very small for people that call it chava. It's almost always referred to as panko or kabuya. It depends on where in Ecuador you are because oftentimes kabuya refers to the other species of agave, which is a green agave um, that's mostly used for fiber. Uh, but, and this is generally, the, they call it panko. Sometimes they'll call it Kabuya Azul, they'll call it the, the blue Kabuya, but the, yeah, the, 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 the traditional words here are Penko or, or Kabuya. So you, I mean, obviously these are, these, these are young plants, these are, these are still yeah. quite small. You wait for them to get to 10 to 13 years old, uh, at which point they would have a lot of concentrated sugars inside, they'll be a lot bigger. Uh, and then you, um, can you talk us through the process uh, or, or, or perhaps show us the process of, of harvesting the, uh, your agua miel? Yeah, let's go, let's switch back to my computer and I have a little video that, that shows how, how they do Okay, perfect. Um, and then you said it takes, just while we're walking there, um, um, you've got about 200 days worth of harvesting from that plant. Uh, before the sugars are removed, and I assume the plant at that point is kind of past its uh, past life, lifespan, right? Yeah. So then at that point, the, the plant dies, um, and we uh, owe it a new gas. Um, mm -hmm. And the, the plant will die. Um, and then generally what, 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 what does happen is that Okay, I'm, I'm gonna switch to the other one. Let me see. Como hacemos? Solo salir. Okay, and we're gonna. Hello. I'm gonna. Yeah. I'll okay, go. I'm back. Hello. Hey. Um. Good to go. So the plant does die, uh, and generally speaking, the process of taking out. The, the agave sap will prevent it from flowering. Um, and so <clears throat> I think we're kind of lucky to sort of be 
on the front end of this new industry. I think that we're not going to be the only ones doing this in Ecuador. This is going to be growing, um, but we can kind of learn from how the sustainable management of, of agave sort of what, what happened in Mexico. How do we make sure that there's enough sexual reproduction? Um, if our nursery back there, or our greenhouse that we just built is actually to start germinating uh, seeds of agave. We're going to be doing both uh, seed sprouting as well as clonal uh, propagation. Um, and I think that's going to be a big part of it. It's like, how do we make sure that, you know, the plant will eventually die? How do we make sure that we can ensure that, uh, that sexual reproduction still happens so that the genetic diversity and the genetic strength of the plant maintains its integrity? Um, but luckily, we have sort of a huge untapped resource here in Ecuador. And we have a lot of time to, to, to put in those best practices and sort of learn from, from Mexico and a lot of the, the struggles that they've had there. That's perfect. So you have a video now on, um, on the harvesting of the, um, of the agave uh, sap. Yeah, okay, I'm gonna see if I can share this screen here. That they, they make a hole at the base of the plant. They make a hole in the base of the plant. They usually use like a like a rebar or like some big metal stick to make a big hole. And they take out a couple of the big leaves, make a hole in the plant, and then they take a little scraper. You have to scrape the inside of it, um, sort of in this little cavity, and then it starts slowly starts filling up with with juice. It takes about a week for the to get the first harvest after you've scraped the inside of it. Um, and then it starts filling up with juice and the, the women go twice a day. So they go once in the morning and once in the evening, um, uh, because if you leave the juice in the plant for longer than that, it'll start fermenting inside the plant and it, and it gets damaged. Um, so you have to go twice a day to each, to each plant, right. And, and, and take it from there. Uh, and then, and then we have this truck, one of the women, um, in the cooperative owns a truck and she goes around with the tank and just collects, it's kind of like a milk milk tank they collect all the juice and they bring it to us and um it's usually we they, she usually arrives at like 10 10 30 in the morning um with 250 liters of our juice and then we just boom start fermenting it and that and that process repeats every day for every day every weekday yeah. every weekday okay so what happens on the weekend you just well that is a good that's a good question yeah, um, <laughs> because they have to keep yeah. harvesting right. um so normally today's Saturday. Normally we, we don't have the, the distillery running today, um, but we decided to do it so we can share with you guys all that we do. Um, so what happens on the weekend, actually on Monday, uh, Carmela, the, the, the woman from the cooperative that drops it off, she, uh, she, does, she drops it off twice. She gives us two batches. So we actually have, so it's sort of like six different days of, uh, of juice. We get like a double one on Monday and we kind of divide the little bit of extra that comes from Sunday in between Monday and, and Tuesday. I assume you just poured some, um, uh, some chawa there. Um, so obviously you like to uh, uh, drink it neat. Um, certainly my favorite way to drink any spirit as well for the most part is neat because I really like to taste the spirit. Um, any, is there any kind of cocktail culture around it? Is there any way uh, to kind of, uh, how would you drink this in a cocktail? How would it best relate? Yeah, so I think, I mean, you know, I think things that are, anything that you would drink tequila with would go well. I think that one of the, the, the things that's really important is that chawar is very, uh, it's a subtle flavor. So it can easily be overpowered 
Um, I think a lot of those floral notes that you get when you drink it neat can be easily overpowered in a, in a cocktail. Personally, if, when, if I were to drink it not neat, I like it with a little sparkling water and, and, and lime or lemon. Um, in Texas, we call it ranch water. Uh, I don't know if other people know what ranch water is. Or sort of like a, or like a caipirinha like that you have with, uh, with uh, rum or, or like a cachaca, right? Um, I think that here, here in Ecuador, actually in, in two weeks, we're going to do another Zoom uh, meeting with sort of the, all the top bartenders in Ecuador who have been experimenting over the last year making different cocktails. Um, I think Ecuador is maybe not the, has the, doesn't have the biggest cocktail culture, uh, but there are some really innovative uh, uh, bartenders who have come up with some really cool ideas. One of the things that I do find really interesting is that it's very versatile and because it's not, it doesn't have that strong tequila flavor that you can do things like my, my sister made a, uh, a white Russian with it, right? Like you, I don't, think you would ever think to make right. a white reaction with tequila I remember you were um, telling me that it blew me away I think it was idea. Uh, but you because it, it has this sweetness that can kind of go it can kind of go with a lot, lot of different flavors um but sort of in terms of our like sort of idea and I kind of like the same kind of question with the still sort of that we're we're very we're, we're really like kind of go with the flow here so what we've been doing is we've been asking all of our consumers to tell us how they make cocktails um, I, a lot of people have been writing us like, I don't know, what, what do I do with this? And, and so what we've done is we've started sharing recipes between different consumers um, and, and sort of let everybody else sort of tell us how they want to drink. Shall That's a great way to um, but I stick to it straight. Straight's the way. Straight's the way for me. And what do you have uh, uh, by uh, way of kind of local fruits to choose from to, to kind oh, of right. drink with? So there was, I, oh man, I, I wish I had some right now. But the, the coolest, so... Here in this region, there's sort of two, two fruits that are really, well, one is Meyer lemons grow all, all over here. And I think Meyer lemons for me are sort of the perfect citrus to go with this. Um, I think you can use limes, sort of like a margarita. Um, you can use uh, grapefruit, like a Paloma also goes amazing. But to me, Meyer lemon, just sort of the, that the subtleness of the Meyer lemon just really accentuates the, the beauty of the, the floral notes. I think that also there's a, and I think this is more popular now in the US than it was. I don't know if you can get in other places. I know we have some people from England and, and, and Canada and other countries here. Uh, but there's a, there's a fruit here that's becoming fairly pop popular called goldenberry, or some people call it an inkenberry. Uh, it's, a, it's actually in the tomatillo family. It's a little, uh, it's a little orange, like tomato, basically, tomatillo. Um, and ooh, there's a thunderstorm coming. In. Uh oh. <laughs> uh, Maybe just a few more questions, and that's it. Then. <laughs> so, uh, so the. Anyways, I think that's a, a really also amazing fruit that that's local to here that um, goes beautifully with it. Perfect, perfect. And we can get them. We're based here in uh, Toronto, and we can. Start oh, you can get them as well. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Um, so uh, we've got a, a question actually from a, 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 a friend of ours from Toronto as well, Ruben, uh, who uh, has a question regarding your waste. So obviously with, uh, uh, with any tequila distillery, a big focus, especially on the, on the good ones, is how they deal with their waste, how they deal with their bagasse and, and, and their bananas and, and, and their stillage and, and fibers. You don't have fibers as much of an issue to deal with, but you will still have stillage as well. How do you deal with your waste? What's your process for that? Yeah, so um, our waste, I mean, we basically is, is just, it's mostly water and a little bit of, of leftover sugar water um, because it's, it, yeah, there's no, there's no, there's no fiber. There's nothing like that. So what we do is we, we just let it go into, <laughs> into our drainage out here. Um, we have a, a drainage filter that would catch any like trash that goes in there. Um, but really it's, it's, it's very new. It's not, um, yeah, it's, it's not a very nasty waste product. What we have done on more of the input side is is water. I mean, the other big issue is is just the amount of water that we use. Um, and what we've done with our water, and actually I can well, maybe I won't show you, but we have we have three tanks. We've started with a water recycling system. 
And so, because we have to have water constantly running through the stills to cool down the, the, the columns. And what we did is we created a, a recycling system. And what's so crazy is like our first month that we didn't, we just basically let all the water go out to our backyard, right? We just let it all go out. Um, our water bill was like a hundred dollars. Okay. We built this recycling system and the next month our water bill dropped to three dollars. So we basically don't even use additional water. We're just constantly recycling the water. It goes through different tanks and it cools down by itself and then it's cool enough to cool down our stills. And I think that's sort of, that's to awesome. me, that is the biggest environmental issue uh, more than the wastewater because the wastewater itself is just, it's basically just water with a little bit of sugar in it. Right. That's awesome. Uh, so, so much of this production is just, is so well thought out. It's, I, I just think it's, I, I, it's such a well put together operation. I'm, I'm so impressed with this. Um, okay. Um, so we do have a note uh, for you from, from Stalin. This isn't a question, but it's definitely a shout out. I uh, hope you like single malt as well still. Um, supposedly that's an inside joke, which I'm going to assume you get. Um, so you do have a thunderstorm coming in. Uh, and I think that we've covered so much of this already. Um, and one last question. This one's a personal one for me. Um, this time next year, where do you want to be? What changes do you want to see? What are you working towards? Um, well, just to mention one thing to start Starling's point about the single malt. We did go to Scotland last year or two years ago. And we learned all about scotch production and we've incorporated that a lot. I'm a, I'm my, both of my grandparents, one on one side, I'm Scottish and on the other side, I'm Mexican. So, uh, and I live in South America. So really I see this as a perfect fusion of my ancestry um, in, so both scotch and, and tequila here. Um, so thank you for that question. But okay. Um, in terms of where do we want to be in a year? Um, really our goal, I mean, our goal here in Ecuador is to really position ourselves as sort of the Ecuador doesn't have a national uh, alcohol that people know about. Um, there, there's some really cheap kind of nasty alcohols. It doesn't have any uh, high quality alcohols. I think so really sort of positioning ourselves to be sort of the pride of Ecuador in terms of an alcohol space is really important for us. Um, and to, to really engage in, in the U S and, and building, building markets. Um, we want to start small. We want to, we want this to be really organic and sort of, you know, word of mouth, but sort of build, uh, build a really strong fan base of people who are, are chawar, chawar heads. Um, and, and we're starting that in the U S. Um, and I would say that, uh, you know, so in a year from now, what I would love, I mean, it's so hard to know what, is going to happen in a year with the world, the world every day I wake up yeah, and read right. the news and it's like, okay. It's the easier question to ask them right now. Uh, yeah. It's like, Oh, I like, cause I thought we would be in bars in Austin, Texas right now, but no, we're not. Uh, and yes, the bars are back open, but I don't know how long that's going to last. So I, I wouldn't say that I, I, I wouldn't say that we're going to be in every bar everywhere. Um, I don't even know about that, but I think that, that we would want to, we want to, grow our brand in four years our our production target is to 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 produce and sell ten thousand cases right now we're at about like one thousand case a year sort of area um and so that's sort of our production goal over the next four years um but at a year from now i would like to have more production i'd like to also have we're considering building a new distillery because right now if you guys notice it's pretty crowded in there um we're, all, we're pretty much at capacity. Um, and as the market grows, we want to build, and we kind of have this idea of creating these satellite distilleries where we can keep small, we can have a small, like a really a, a lesser impact on the region, both environmentally, but also on the, the agave populations, right? Because all of this right now is wild harvested. We're growing stuff, but that'll be in the future. I want to build a new distillery, a, another small distillery in another area so that we can start you know, understanding the terroir, the different, the, how the volcanic soils in a different geography affect the flavor. Um, and so I think by next year, I hope to have another distillery up. I hope to have a new line of a different volcano. That's sort of our idea is that we want to, we want to have every uh, line of, of, of Chawar kind of align with the volcano so that you understand this is 
the volcano. This is the soils. This is the legend of this volcano. This is the, the mythology of this volcano. Um, and so hopefully next year we'll have, we'll have a new volcano under our belt. <laughs> I love that. That's amazing. Um, all right. Uh, so oh, one last question. Um, can you find it at the LCBO yet? For anyone watching, that's the Ontario liquor store. That's, that's going to be a long way off. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, Canada, not quite yet. I know there's a lot of Canadians out there, and thank you so much. I hope so. I hope soon. If I mean, call me if you are a distributor and you're interested. But right. Uh, <laughs> right. probably right. a few years off before we're in, in Canada. The, in the meantime, we'll get one of our American friends to uh, get it shipped to their place and we'll pick it up. Okay. The, we'll yeah. Um, so I'm going to send uh, your research paper to everybody who registered for this talk. Uh, thank you so much for sharing that. It's a great read and, uh, and it's got a lot of great information in there. So I will be sharing that around. Um, and then I'm going to uh, post the uh, edited version of this talk. Uh, onto our website as well. Um, uh, I want to thank you sincerely. I'm going to wrap this up now because you do have a storm coming in uh, and we're just over the, uh, just under 90 minute mark. Uh, but I want to thank you uh, so much, Elliot, for this. This was, uh, I, I just had the most wonderful time personally uh, talking to you today and learning about this. Just so much information. I love what you feel. I sincerely do. I think it's just fantastic. So thanks so much for your time. Thank you for your team. Congratulations on your second birthday and, uh, and, and, and for all the subsequent birthdays ahead of you as well. So thank you so much, man. Thank you. Thank you so much too for, for hosting us and, and bringing all these people together. And uh, it was a yeah, beautiful idea. And I hope to see you soon again in person. Oh, uh, yeah. Next year. Next year. Back at the San Antonio Cocktail Conference. I'll see you there. Okay. Sure. Let's do it. And, um, yes. and you know what? I mean, we say this every week. The idea of this, this came about during coronavirus when everyone was locked down and we wanted to be able to provide something um, uh, that, that gives people the ability to leave their homes and to explore and to travel while in, when they can't. And, and this was we got to bring everyone to Ecuador today. Thanks to, thanks to you and your, and your team. So uh, just wonderful. Yeah. So thanks, man. Um, awesome. folks, Thank everybody you. watching next week, we're uh, back in Mexico. We're going to be at the distillery of Altos Tequila. Uh, that's a brand that's very close to my heart as well. I was the national brand ambassador for, for that brand here in, in Canada for a few years. And, and, uh, and uh, I really love that brand and I'm super excited about that too. But uh, from uh, Ecuador and with Elliot and the team at Chawa, a sincere thank you from all of us, comrade. Thank you. All right. All the best. See you all around. See you, buddy. Bye, mate.